Hi, everyone. Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you today with my colleague, Nicole Collins. Hi, everyone. We are from Firebird Healing, and we wanted to talk with you to, today a little bit about what does it mean to triumph over trauma? And this is the tagline of Firebird Healing. And I just wanted to start by saying a little bit about why I chose that particular um, catchphrase and, and the symbolism of the phoenix bird. If any of you know from mythology, I can't remember if it's Greek or Roman mythology or some other mythology, but this idea that there's a bird that rises from the ashes of the ruin, right? And this bird is like this bird of fire, right? The phoenix bird is rises from the fire of the ruins and transforms into this great beast that like triumphs over all of the ruin. And I think that's just that that symbol of transformation has been so powerful for me in my own life um, with all the transformation that has occurred throughout my life and throughout the lives of the clients that I work with. I think particularly people who have experienced trauma. Um, Nicole and I both work a lot with trauma and with addiction. Um, and so those themes, I think, run pretty prevalent in, in working with folks like that. But, you know, I also wanted to introduce the idea of post-traumatic growth. Um, Nicole, why don't you tell us a little bit about post-traumatic growth and how that fits in with this idea of triumphing over trauma? Well, post-traumatic growth is like being able to take good out of something terrible that maybe has happened or an adversity that you've had in your life. And the way I've always looked at it is like the traumas that I've endured in, in my life have made me uniquely qualified to help somebody else. And they have been this, this great gift. Um, so post-traumatic growth can be really beautiful and you can experience such insane gratitude and joy when you kind of come out of the other side of the trauma and start to grow and create your own meaning. Exactly. It, I think you said the key thing right there is creating meaning. You know, um, Dr. Gabor Mate, you know, talks about how it's not what happened to you. It's about the meaning you make from it, right? And so many people, when they've had horrible things happen, what we would call traumatic events, um, they tend to look at it through a negative lens, right? Like this terrible thing happened to me. I was powerless over, over it. And it really fosters this victim consciousness. We talk a lot about victim consciousness um, at Firebird and, and in our work with conscious recovery, which really speaks to this as well. Um, what is a victim consciousness, Nicole? Victim consciousness is like the world is happening to you. And because you have been a victim in your life, you constantly continue to be victimized by life, not really realizing that you have power and control over your life, your relationships, your mental health, right? Like through, through getting help, through using tools, through, you know, having community that it's possible that life maybe is no longer happening to you. A lot of things happened to us when we were kids and we were victims, right? And we have been victimized throughout our lives, but then that same idea continues through life. Right. Like I'm no longer, I'm not an active participant in my life. Life is just continually happening to me. Yes. It's like those experiments, we learned about these awful experiments they did back in the day with the dogs and the learned helplessness, right? They, yeah. the dogs, they kept, they had them in a cage with like an electrical like grid or something on the bottom. And they kept giving the dogs these electrical shocks, right? They were traumatizing these dogs over and over again. And at first the dogs would, you know, kick and bark and try to get away from, from the shocks. And eventually they give up. And they just lay there in the cage, allowing themselves passively to just keep getting shocked over and over again. And it's to illustrate, I know it's a terrible example, but terrible. It's, it's, to, it's to illustrate the point of, of learned helplessness. Yeah. It, because people, especially if they experience traumatic things at an early age, you often will come, see, this is when, especially when you're young and you're just starting to like formulate your views on the world and on yourself, and if you have these things that are happening in your life, you're going to come to believe things like I'm powerless, right? You're going to develop these core false beliefs. Like I'm powerless. I cannot control what happens to me. Um, bad things happen to me. Maybe it's my fault that these things have happened. And so when you carry 
those beliefs and you actually think that they're true, you're going to then keep attracting more and more situations. This is why we see, for example, you know, when we work at the rehab, we see so many women that come having had childhood abuse, and then they'll get into domestic violence or intimate partner violence type situations as an adult. They'll repeat those patterns over and over again because they are functioning from that fundamental core false belief that I deserve it, or this is just what happens to me. I can't control it. Um, just these limiting beliefs that end up actually becoming the way we create our reality. Right. Yeah. So when we're looking at shifting our perspective on the experiences, rewriting our story, moving out of victim consciousness and, and into like from a survival, just surviving kind of idea into thriving, which is really what I think the spirit is of what we're trying to do at Firebird. Um, Nicole, in your own journey, what's what's been helpful for you in making that shift? Gosh. Yeah. So I'm in recovery myself and, um, my first year of sobriety, <clears throat> I was really on this, this beautiful pink cloud and life was fantastic and, and amazing. And I really didn't know everything that was possible. And then all of a sudden I was kind of, um, confronted with the severity of, of my mental health. And I really got into that victim consciousness again. And a lot of it for me is a lot of self-blame, a lot of self-pity, um, like, oh, I, I'm not a depressed person. Like this, there's people who have had so much more trauma than me, you know, like I can't, I don't need medication. I don't need outside help. I don't need any of those things to to feel better or really thinking that I, it wasn't, I wasn't capable of feeling any better. Um, and, uh, almost two years into sobriety, um, my partner and my sister were going to send me off to get real severe mental health help. I was, um, attempting suicide at two years of sobriety. I had engaged in cutting behavior again, something I hadn't done since I was a teenager, really, I, I felt so completely helpless. Um, and I don't know what switched for me, but I realized like, oh no, I've, I've persevered all these things in my life. Um, I've had this, you know, this childhood that was not fantastic, but not terrible. I, you know, and I, and I've made it this far and I've, and I'm sober now and I no longer have to live a life that is dictated by other people and that I have real power to change. And so I sought that outside help. I got onto medications. I found a therapist. Um, I started really looking at myself and what was going on and realizing that I could, um, that my life could be different. Right. And, and I never really thought I would have a life where, uh, I wasn't suicidal. And uh, I have that life today. And like, that's incredible. And that story for me is really powerful because it makes me uniquely qualified to help other people who have similar experiences, right? And so through this growth, through this transformation, through this really difficult time in sobriety, right? Like truly living life on life's terms, no drugs, no alcohol, no other coping skills, you know, no other brilliant strategies to help me through. Um, I had to really do the work and dig in and no longer be a victim to life and realize like I was an active participant in my life and what happened around me. And so post-traumatic growth has been like, so beautiful, really almost re-traumatizing at a certain point. But then through, when I got onto that other side of it, I was able to see like, oh my gosh, I am capable of so much. Right. And nothing has to really stand, stand in my way. Um, and I love that. And I love to be able to, to bring that to people, to see them with severe depression and, and to say like, I know. Yeah, I know. Well, because when you're in the depths of it, it feels, especially depression, I think it feels like a black hole. You know, you can't, oh. you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You can't see light of any kind. Everything is just black and bleak and hopeless. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So many yeah. people struggle with that. You said so many important things and thank you for sharing your story because um, you, you won, you did the comparison thing. I think that so many people do. Well, I didn't have it that bad. Oh, look, listen to these people. Wow. They really had some trauma and we tend to minimize, you know, we talk about big T trauma and little T trauma, and we tend to minimize our own experiences, even when they're big T traumas. Well, you know, he didn't hit me that bad. Oh, well, you know, I, whatever, move on, get over it. And this is, I think, such a misnomer, right? So many people are told, just get on with it, put it in the past, don't think about that stuff. And what we now know about trauma and how it works like physiologically and what happens with our bodies when we experience these events that are overwhelming to us is like, you can't just put it behind you and move on typically, right? right. Like the trauma sticks with us. Right. Yeah. We were doing a seeking safety and at, at Avery Lane and uh, a client, the, the, the quote was, um, listen to your heart. It, it whispers. So like, listen closely. And she was like, I can't, mm -hmm. my heart is too quiet. My trauma is the loudest thing in any room that I'm in. That's what I listen to. Right. right? It comes, it goes with her everywhere she is. Yeah. Yep. It's in your body. Um, it changes the way your brain functions. You know, a lot of people get, have this like on edge thing all the time, this hypervigilance, or a lot of people get stuck in the shutdown, kind of the, of the fight, flight, freeze, you know, they're either stuck in fight or flight or they're stuck in freeze. Um, your brain functions differently. You come to believe things about yourself and your experiences that may not be true. And so you really can't put it behind you. I do have to say in my experience of, oh, go 25 or years more now going on personally and professionally, I don't think you can not deal with your past. If there are things from your past that have really seriously impacted you in a negative way and you have this unresolved trauma, it is firmly my belief that you need, to, not even my belief, my knowing that you have to look at those things and be willing to do the work. And thankfully now we have these wonderful techniques and modalities that actually make doing the processing and releasing of the trauma a lot easier. Um, Sometimes people feel like, I think with therapy, traditional talk therapy, like, why do I want to go to a therapist and just talk about my trauma over and over again? Um, we, at least at Firebird, are using very innovative, uh, holistic healing methods, energetically based ones and somatically based ones to really help people access and release uh, the energy of the trauma that's locked in their bodies and their brains. And, you know, if we want, we can talk a little bit about that. But I just think that um, to not, to not deal with it. And, and maybe you can speak to this too, Nicole, what happens when people don't deal with their unresolved trauma over time? It just crops up in other ways. It never, it doesn't leave. Like the, it's like you take a few steps forward and then you just keep going back. Yeah. Right? And if we look at like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, if we're not addressing that trauma, we're never at a stable place to be able to like continually go up that pyramid to find like full self-actualization because the feelings of safety, if we're not really looking at this trauma don't exist. So if we don't have safety in our emotional life, um, we're not moving up into self-actualization. We're not finding that community. We're not able to expand, to grow, to really continue and, and move forward towards, towards those things that we really want. And we'll continue to really hold us back. And then those core false beliefs are just so loud. Yeah. So if you're not looking at the trauma and the core false beliefs continue to crop up and they're loud, they're just holding us back. That's what I see. That's what I see with people. I see that unresolved trauma over time just piles up. It's yeah. almost like, um, you know, you're trying to not deal with it. So it's like putting all, everything in a junk closet, right? And you keep putting more and more stuff in the junk closet and eventually like it's so full and you're trying to like, you know, keep it like with your foot, keep it closed. And eventually yeah. it all just comes tumbling out. Um, and we see that we see people have, especially in this pandemic, I think that was a big catalyst for a lot of people with unresolved trauma. Suddenly they're stuck inside, they're stuck with themselves. They can't use the distractions yep. that they, you know, were maybe using in the past to try to avoid or, or numb some of that, um, or we saw, and we saw things get worse with drug and alcohol use and food to cope and all these things. Um, so eventually it will take its toll and we see progression with mental, you know, disorders. We see progression with addiction. 
the addictive behaviors, that those things tend to get worse if you're not actually dealing with the underlying causes of which unresolved trauma often is. I mean, when I was writing my dissertation, you know, and, and looking at the statistics, it was some, like something like eight, up to 80% of clients or people who have um, issues with addiction have some sort of trauma in their background. Yeah. Some sort of overwhelming experience at, or usually a series or, of experiences um, that really had an imp- have an impact on you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Right. 80%. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and one of the things we see a lot, you know, we both work at this drug and alcohol rehab. Maybe you can speak to this a little bit is how many clients we come that say something like, this is my 10th rehab program. And I haven't been able to stay sober longer than X amount of time. Um, but I, but my trauma was never addressed. Right. Yes. Most addiction treatment, um, is, is to look at just the person and their addiction really actually like, it's like, it's like the person is separated into parts. So we're not looking at like the whole person. We're just looking at the addiction and just treating that when really we need to look at like, what is the catalyst for the addiction? What hole is trying to be filled? What wound is trying to be healed, covered up, put a bandaid, triaged, you know, with drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's kind of special that we do, you know, at Avery, at Avery Lane is that we, we treat the whole person, right? And I think it's so important, especially in drug and alcohol to treat the whole person because alcohol is just drugs and alcohol are a symptom of the problem. They're not the real problem. Yeah. Right? Not the real and, issue. And like you said, and, and our friend TJ Woodward has a similar story. It's like just getting off the drugs and the alcohol and being sober isn't really recovery. It's just mm-hmm. being sober. Yeah. And recovery, recovering your yourself, the parts and pieces of yourself that you maybe have gotten disconnected from because of traumatic experiences, right? Because it takes away your innocence. It can take away your joy. It can take away your hope. Um, or your sense of safety until you address those issues, um, you might be white knuckling your sobriety, but you're not really, you're in survival mode still. You're surviving, you're not thriving. And what we wanna do is really support people in making that transition from surviving to thriving. And we know that there are steps to trauma treatment. We know there's stages. You know, first you have to work with creating safety. You have to um, give people tools to manage their emotions, right? And what we call them emotional regulate, self-regulation tools. We use a lot of them in our practice. Um, we use breathing techniques, uh, EFT tapping, some other energy psychology stuff, some DBT stuff, dialectical behavioral therapy. I mean, all techniques that basically work with helping you to deal with intense emotions when they arise. Um, helping you deal with that fight, flight, freeze response when it happens, because your logical thinking brain cannot stop a panic attack, cannot stop, you know, a fight, flight, freeze response, because a more primitive part of your brain has hijacked your brain and has taken over. So you're not able to rational, rationalize your way out of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting sometimes, I think there's like this recovery arc image. I don't, do you know what it's called? And it's, and it goes like this, mm-hmm. it has like all these stages. And I'm like, that's like so misleading. Like, that's, yeah. that's not like what we're covering. It's not linear. Like. It's not like this. It's way more like, woo. Like, woo. like yeah, like a, exactly. Like a crazy roller coaster. Yeah. Yeah. My first sponsor said, buckle up girl, you're in for a hell of a ride. And I was like, I don't know what she's talking about. And she was right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we have to give the people the, this, you know, help creating that sense of safety internally, as well as externally. Um, you know, there may be some changes. You may need to get out of an abusive relationship or something like that. you right. You have to first create that sense of safety and then, you know, start regulating the emotions, start looking at some of the belief systems that are driving some of those emotions, uh, do the trauma processing itself. That's right. a big piece. And then, you know, the stage that I'm like looking at with creating this, this workshop I'm going to be doing, um, hopefully starting in March, it's, it's under construction right now, but I'm wanting to create a workshop through Firebird um, called From Survival to Thrival and really now looking at, okay, for those people who have done some work on themselves, 
have some of these tools, have more safety. Maybe they've gotten clean and sober from drugs and alcohol, but now they're like, okay, now what? Now what do I do? You know, maybe I've even processed through some of my trauma, but now how do I like create my life? How do I have healthy relationships? How do I um, take care of myself? Um, how can I start working on goals and dreams that I have, right? I'm really curious about how we can support people at that stage of their trauma recovery as well. So stay tuned. That's, that'll be coming soon. Yeah. It um, sounds like you're really talking about like creating meaning and purpose out of, out of your life. Yeah. Right. And the idea of, I saw you post the other day of the idea of coping versus healing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, coping is like what you said, it's the band-aid, right? It's like what I'm doing to survive creating your life healing. That's where the thriving can occur. Like, could you have imagined if I had told you when we, if you, if I had met you early in sobriety and I told you, Hey, did you know it's possible to create a life of infinite possibilities? What would you have said? No, <laughs> like I wouldn't even know what you were talking about. My yeah. first sponsor had me write down a list of what I wanted my life to look like in a year. <clears throat> and uh, I think I had like three things on it. Yeah. And I, I could not, I could not have imagined what was possible. My brain was not like equipped to think like that yet. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really what the work that we're doing. We can meet people at Firebird at any stage of their trauma healing process. Truly. We have people that come fresh from something or fresh out of rehab, um, you know, really like something or something just terrible. has just occurred. Um, there's a lot we can do in the beginning, in the early stages of when a trauma, traumatic event has occurred, all the way through the stage I'm talking about. You know, the, the phoenix bird is now rising from the ashes and we want it to soar and fly freely and, and be free of all the suffering. Um, it's, it's, we can meet you wherever you're at. And Nicole and I both, you know, work with clients individually at Firebird. We're doing more and more. She's done this amazing inner child workshop. I think that's wrapping up soon. Yeah. Night tonight is the last night and uh, people are wanting more. So yeah. it's really cool. They're like, what's, can we do step two, phase two? Like, can we get in deeper? So I've really loved it. It's been beautiful. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're under construction, creating more and more programs. We have another therapist getting ready to onboard, um, who's also an expert in working uh, with all these modalities and holistically and creatively. She's also an art therapist. I'm just super excited. We're talking about healing retreats. We've got the Conscious Recovery Bali retreat. Mm. If you're thinking about, think earlier than later. Um, we're definitely getting people signed up for that. And just yeah, we want to be that beacon of light is, you know, cheesy metaphor, but like be that light in the darkness that shows people like, hey, we personally have struggled. My my struggle I've talked about before wasn't so much around drugs and alcohol, it was more around health stuff. Like I was brought to my knees with my Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome and all the years of struggle around that. And I triumphed over that trauma too, so, you know, and, and here I am and Nicole and I are here to show you that you can triumph over your trauma. We have the tools and techniques. We have this, the support is out there. You don't have to do this alone. Um, if you're willing to do the work, you, you, the, the payoff is immense. The possibilities are infinite. Yeah, they're incredible. Yeah. yeah. Any final thoughts, Nicole? No, just thank you so much. I love this conversation. I love this topic. It's so nice to reflect on my own story and growth and to help people see that like, it's possible. Like anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah, truly it is. Um, so thanks everyone who's watching. If you found this video helpful, please do like it, comment, share. Let's get those algorithms, you know, working to get this out there in the world and um, stay tuned. If you want to find out more, if you want to get on our mailing list, um, you just go to firebird-healing.com. And if you sign up for the mailing list, first of all, you'll get free five free vi videos I made with some emotional self-regulation techniques um, that I have found really helpful. So you can get those videos for free and you can also be on the mailing list so you can find out about workshops and um, groups and everything else that we've got cooking here at Firebird. So thank you, Nicole, for being with us today and sharing your story. Thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you.